I'm going to actually talk a little bit about history first because in the late 80s I started getting involved in the internet. I was actually in mainstream media before doing motion pictures, television, journalism uh, and when I first saw the internet starting, when I first saw a PPP and I first downloaded the images from the NASA satellite and I downloaded I don't know if everyone is probably too young to remember this, but there was a site called MTV.com and there was a, uh, uh, a DJ named Adam Curry and he had these stupid videos uh, that were QuickTime that you could download from the internet and you could see. And I remember going to the chairman of NHK, which is a Japanese broadcasting company, and I downloaded this video and I showed him. And he said, who owns this network? And I said, no one owns this network. And he said, does Murdoch own this network? And I said, no, Murdoch doesn't own this network. And he said, can I own this network? And I said, no, you can't own this network. And that was when I realized that the me big media guys were not going to understand the internet, and the internet would change everything. And I was a young, I was probably a teenager back then, and I was about to start my career in mainstream media, and I decided I'm going to build the internet, because that's going to be much more interesting and about when I get to the right age, we'll have built the internet. And the internet from a technology perspective is layers. It's like a big pancake. And so first thing you have to build is the network. And so I was very involved in the first commercial internet service provider in Japan, was the first CEO. And when we were trying to build the internet in Japan, uh, if, again, this is old history, but the UN had a thing called CCITT, which eventually became the ITU, but it's the telecommunications body of the United Nations. And they had their own kind of version of something that looked like the internet. It was called X25. And most of Europe was working with this sort of UN system, and Japan was doing it. But the Americans decided they're going to go do this um, uh, military-funded crazy thing called the internet, which had less control, didn't have an international government um, thing. It was actually ad hoc and kind of this crazy thing. But we believe that the internet was a much better model because instead of spending years and years with experts trying to define some huge specification that some big telephone company would implement, internet, the Internet Engineering Task Force, where we were, they were designing the protocols, the credo <coughs> was called rough consensus running code. So you'd kind of come up with a general idea, and then you'd write the software. And then as you wrote the software, it would start to evolve. Whereas the uh, old UN method was you have many experts to get together for years and years and years, and you create a specification that anticipated every problem, every risk, every feature. It was about this high, and no individual could ever build the software. You had to have the big companies, and big companies that paid big tax with big governments and big labs. And the internet was, David Weinberger uses the term, small pieces loosely joined. Most of the in essential elements of the internet, whether it was FTP or the TCP IP stack, they're all designed by groups of three or four people, two or three people, and they all connect together in this loosely defined open protocol, and anyone can participate in the ITF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Teenagers can write code, teenagers can participate, big companies, governments, it's a very flat organization, and the governments and big companies hated it because it was open, anyone could participate, no one had permission, and the telephone companies, if you remember in the old days, they didn't let you connect anything to the telephone jack without a stamp from the government. If you couldn't, you, modems had to be authorized by the government. And so the whole idea was before it was centrally planned, very uh, carefully selected companies, carefully selected experts, and it was important because they were spending so much money on the infrastructure, they were afraid that hackers or bad people would destroy this network. And it's a fundamental philosophy difference of central planning, closed and control versus open, chaos, um, you know, access without asking permission, innovation without asking permission, very much about openness, right? And the early days when we were trying to set up the internet in Japan, the lawyers said this is illegal, the technology people said this would never work, the economists said, oh, who's going to pay for this? And the internet was basically written off in Japan as uh, impossible. And I think in Europe it was a very similar argument. But we built the internet and we won, right? And what we found by winning on the internet is you don't have to control everything. You don't have to know the whole of it. Each person works on their own piece, takes responsibility for their own risk, uses open protocols to connect with each other, and you have this open innovation, open competition. It dramatically lowers the cost. 
Now, one problem with lowering the cost, one person's cost is some other person's revenue. So the phone companies and a lot of people that used to generate a lot of revenue and a lot of margin by overcharging because they had monopolies, now suddenly lost this revenue. So some people lost some money. But I think everyone will agree that in the long run, the internet has generated more economic growth, more civil society value than if it didn't exist, right? We have, I think the internet is a net positive effect. And today we don't argue whether the internet is good or bad. You know, we argue about certain policy decisions, but the internet is no longer a political discussion about whether we should do internet. Sometimes we discuss why, how we should do internet. It's very similar with Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is another layer. I, well, I'll go one more layer before I go to Creative Commons. So when the World Wide Web came out, um, and Tim Berners-Lee proposed the World Wide Web. Before that, we had Gopher, we had databases, we had all these different ways we can access data. And I remember all the computer scientists saying, World Wide Web is stupid. We can already do everything. We have documents, we have links, we can do everything. Why should we make it so easy that you can click and that anyone can make a web page? We already have professionals who know how to make these databases. But by creating the World Wide Web, what we had was the teacher can make their own web page and users can create their own web page. And all of a sudden, we democratize the ability to make websites that distributed content. And suddenly, we had an explosion of innovation just by lowering the friction and by creating an open standard that anyone could understand. Because before the World Wide Web, you had things like SGML and Gopher and all these things. You had to be an expert in order to create any kind of content or put content on the web. And you had to hire somebody. The web basically made it so that anyone could create a web page. And again, this is the critical value that also is often misunderstood is by lowering the cost, the internet has allowed collaboration that didn't exist before. Linux exploded because it came out just around when the internet was exploding. And so all of these programmers could collaborate at a very, very low cost. If they had to send in the old days open source, you send paper tapes by mail. So the universities could do open source, but the average kid at home couldn't participate in open source. But with internet, suddenly open source, you could have millions of people participating. And in the same way, the, the web allowed millions of people to participate rather than just hundreds of people. And the lowering the cost is essential because it lowers the cost of failure and it lowers the cost of innovation. Because one of the things that we know from venture capital is that, you know, so I'm an investor in Twitter and I've talked to the other Twitter investors. And, you know, to be honest, nobody would have said Twitter is the one. You know, we like Ev, and it was an interesting investment, but we all feel lucky, right? We make hundreds of investments, and some of them succeed, but the ones that succeed are not obvious. You know, Last FM, I didn't, had no idea that that would be that successful, and some of the companies like Six Apart that I thought would be super successful still hasn't exited. You know, and it's very, it's, you never know, right? And the thing that we re know from all of the great things that are happening, all the bad things that are happening, the financial crisis, the Arab Spring, you never know, right? No one, some people would have predicted, but it's random. The, the only way that you deal with the complexity of today is you have to place a lot of bets. And how do you place a lot of bets? You place a lot of bets by lowering the cost of placing the bets. And you lower the cost of placing the bets, and you lower the cost of taking risks by lowering the cost of collaboration, the lowering the cost of production. And I think that this is something that people forget. It takes a lot of energy for a big company to do what we say, swing the bat, right? So a big Japanese company that I know, you know, it takes them $3 million to think about whether to do something, right? Whereas the average startup company is about $100,000 to start up. The average free software project is zero to start up. And so you can try many things. Like Wikipedia, no one would have, venture capitalists would have given Wikipedia money. Oh, we're going to make a website. Anyone can edit and we'll be the biggest encyclopedia in the world. That doesn't sound like a business plan that somebody would give you money for, but they now are able to raise money. They have become one of the biggest sites in the world. It's only in retrospect that it becomes obvious that things like Wikipedia happen. So in order to think about just generally, fundamentally, innovation drives the economy, um, and that innovation requires um, taking lots of risks, and taking lots of risks requires lowering the cost of participation, lowering the cost of innovation, and lowering the cost of participation means lowering the barriers, which also includes the a requiring asking permission and um, open access. And so making, giving access to the legal documents, giving access to um, educational materials, giving access to code, all of these make it so that more and more people can innovate. You know? And so on the education side, and this is where Creative Commons starts to come in, 
is that now the next layer up where everything is locked up is the copyright layer. There's so much stuff. So, so you're lucky because the, the, you know, the Spanish government knows you shouldn't copyright the law um, because obviously it's, it's, it's the commons. But in many countries, stuff that's funded by taxpayer money is copyrighted. I had this insane argument with a public broadcaster who was trying to sell content that they were producing in public broadcast. And I said, well, no, it should be free because um, the taxpayer paid for it. And he said, no, 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 but we have to um, pay for the distribution system. And I said, well, why don't you just put it online? And he said, no, no, because we have to charge and we have a billing system. And I said, well, why do you have a billing system? Oh, because we have to pay for the infrastructure. You know? <laughs> and it's this kind of very stupid thing that you don't realize that you get into these kind of modes when people re think that everything has to make some money. You know? and, and there are many ways that sharing is very important. And, and in, in education, I think it's also essential because in the old days, you know, to bring students to a school like this for, you know, the illustrated you know, manuscripts to be shared, the cost of spreading information about education and the cost of having these kind of meetings was so high. But now we're live streaming it. You know, anyone can view this. Anyone can ask Twitter questions. We can put videos online. We used, we, so the institutions of education were designed in a period of scarcity. When, you, when it costs so much money to educate one person, you had to pick the smartest kids in society in order to make the investment to educate them. And then they became the next uh, sort of custodian of this, this uh, flow of knowledge from the past to the future. But today, we're in a world of abundance where anyone should have access to educational materials. But I think the Physics Journal, I think, costs about $18,000 a year to subscribe. So if you're a young student, in a developing country, you don't have access to any of the uh, major scientific publications because the cost is too high. Now, obviously, the academic journals are very important because in the past, they were the messengers that connected Cambridge to this university, to MIT, and they were the, the infrastructure where all of this knowledge was shared. They had an essential role. But now, in the days of the internet, suddenly these people who have the copyright on these academic journals, they're the ones that are erecting the walls and making it so that everyone doesn't have access to this academic work. Now, I can understand the business reason for that, because they need to make the money to print the things to do the. But if you think about it from a much higher perspective, is there any really good reason that science should not be available to everyone in the whole world, especially if we're hoping that innovation can come from anyone in the whole world? And now with the cost of innovation going down so low and the ability for people to collaborate so much, one of the biggest problems I see is that this access to knowledge is being blocked by, um, um, by, these, by these business models. Now, the thing, the thing that Creative Commons can do is help to try to move these business models from the old model to the new model somewhat slowly. So you can say, first, if you have to make money, let's say um, you have to collect money from commercial institutions, maybe you make the non-commercial rights available so that people who want to access the works uh, as individuals can do so. And then you, know, you have organizations like Al Jazeera who gave it all away, and then they'll tell you they actually made more money. And so some of these people can take the plunge and try to make money. But I think what's essential to think about as we think about it from a higher level, from a civil society perspective, is we're going from a world where it, it used to cost too much money to distribute information, therefore we had to erect a business model to do that, to a world where the distribution of information is nearly free, and there's so much value to society of sharing information, but in order to go from here to here, we have to have several transition steps. Um, I think you know, journalism is another very important one, because journalism is probably one of the fundamental um, components of open democracy where you have, to, you have to be able to be critical of authority, you have to be able to dig into this stuff. But the problem is, right now, journalism is wrapped around printing presses and transponders and a lot of these physical assets and this huge management, which is often inside of a content company. And content companies, by the way, are very short-term, right? They're, they're often public companies, they're looking for short-term revenues. Journalism should be long-term. You know, journalism should be, I'm writing about this thing, you may not be interested in it. And then a year later, you say, you know, they were right. right? It's, it's a long-term bet versus a short-term bet. And also, journalism should have a much higher calling. It's, it's a fundamental function of, of democracy, not just a fundamental function of business. Right? And so the, the question is, so Al Jazeera is an interesting example because they're state-run. 
Um, they do make some money. But there's a question is, should journalism be part of uh, public commercial companies? Should it be state-run? Should it be a nonprofit organization? Should it be journalists as individual um, citizens who make a business model of uh, being funded directly? There, there are a lot of questions about how journalists should work. And I think there's a lot of experimentation. The interesting thing is I think the experimentation is happening more among the amateurs and less among the big companies. I think the big company journalism is, is a, there, there's some experimentation, but it's ex experimenting, assuming that the management doesn't lose their job. You know, and if you look at the 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 the, the P and Ls and the balance sheets of the big media companies, generally, on the P and on the balance sheet, the biggest assets are buildings and printing presses or studios and transponders, and most of the costs go to distribution and management, and the smallest chunk is to the journalists, right? And so, so I think you know, if you th rethink this whole journalism model. Now, to get back to where Creative Commons comes in is it, it allows a lot of hybrids to happen. It allows um, media institutions to share some of their data. It allows citizen um, media to share um, content into journalism. And I think what's going to be very important is, again, to experiment with a lot of different models, to try to mix citizen journalism with professional journalism. And the problem right now is with the all rights reserved uh, model, which is without Creative Commons, it's, it's not very flexible. Um, because what, you, what it requires, it requires that you have a, tra a legal transaction every time you want to do something. So for instance, if I want to contract a journalist, we have to exchange a contract. Um, and if I'm asking you, I want to use your material just for this thing, I'm going to send you a Japanese contract, you're going to get a translator, the translator is going to translate it, it's going to take us time and money, and actually it probably will cost more money for, in legal fees than the value of the transaction. And, and similarly, if two institutions, if we want to do a co-production between a S Spanish television show and a Japanese television show, I'm sure that that cost of the legal fees, so this used to be my business, um, the legal fee would be $20,000. And so this gets back to the very similar value of the internet and the web, is the friction, the cost of the transaction now to do collaboration and sharing is so high that it makes it almost, um, doesn't make any business sense. And what Creative Commons is trying to do with the six licenses that we have is to reduce the, uh, the, the common types of transactions. You may use this for non-commercial use. You may use this, but don't create derivatives. You may use this, but you have to share back. And we're trying to, we try to identify the main categories of decisions that people like to make when they're sharing and reduce them into s simple icons and simple contracts that anyone can use because the law is very difficult. I mean, I think that copyright law was originally designed to prevent companies from exploiting other companies. Because copying used to be something that only big companies did, only printing presses did. But now with the internet, everybody copies. Um, every time you look at a web page, you're actually copying it, right? And so it's a very complex law that really wasn't designed to be used by individuals. And so that's why I use the word um, in, uh, user interface for copyright. But Creative Commons is also trying to make it so that the individual creator or the individual user can understand and express their decisions uh, using Creative Commons. Now, we, in the book, we call it the power of open. And Creative Commons definitely has a tendency to like things to be open. But as a technology, and this is, again, very similar to the internet, we're not trying to force people to give away their rights. Okay? So, so if, if, you are making, if you're not making business sense, as an individual, I will argue with you and say, you know, you'll make more money if you make it open. But I'm not trying, one of the big mistakes, I think, not mistakes, but uh, misconceptions is that we're trying to make people give away their stuff. And, and that's not true. What Creative Commons is doing is saying, you have made a decision about how you want to use your copyright. It's still always your copyright, but we are giving you the legal tools and the technical tools to express your decision. And that's really all Creative Commons is. Now, we have an opinion about whether something should be open or closed, so it's a little bit tricky. But we don't like to push this opinion on everyone else. If you ask us, we'll tell you our opinion. But we are trying to transition more and more into an infrastructure which is just a way to legally and technically express people's rights. And we're actually working very closely with other rights organizations. So in the United States now, 
the Motion Picture Association, the Record, uh, the RIAA, they have all started to be supporters of Creative Commons because they believe this idea that uh, your decisions should be expressed technically and legally in a robust way. And because Creative Commons is friendly with the World Wide Web Consortium and the open standards, we've started to create these um, technical standards that allow copyright to be expressed inside of the HTML. And we led the movement in this, and this is not just for Creative Commons, it allows strong copyright owner, um, copyright licenses also to be expressed in this language, because we believe that it's important to have an interoperable standard. And this is another uh, key thing, because a lot of the copyright people that we talk to create copyright licenses and create these standards and icons and things like that, but to have a machine-readable, interoperable standard is essential. Having one internet is why internet is great. If we have five internets, a Spanish internet and a Japanese internet, it's not really internet. And one of the big problems that we see is a lot of people say, okay, I'm gonna make my own license. You know, like, uh, we'll use Creative Commons, but we'll change this. Or a lot of universities like to add this or add that. But interoperability is very important because what you want is you want Google or all of these other guys to be able to find all of the licenses that they can use. And if you, prolif we call it license proliferation. If you have many licenses that look like Creative Commons, then you can't connect. Because, so the, a good example is Wikipedia. A few year, until a few years ago, Wikipedia had a license that was very similar to Creative Commons. It was called the GFDL. It was created by the Free Software Foundation for distribution of their manuals. And GFDL is almost the same as Creative Commons share alike. It says you can do anything you want with this as long as you share it back. The problem is GFDL, it's shared back under GFDL. And many professors and, and schools are using Creative Commons share alike that said you can do anything with this content that you like as long as you share it back. But share it back under each license, you can't mix these two. It's almost like, you know, Islam and Christianity and Judaism. They all believe in God, but it's slightly different God, you know. And so the problem when you split the root is that you create islands that don't mix. And so this sounds a little bit imperialistic, but it was very important to get Wikipedia to switch to a Creative Commons license. It took us nearly five years to do this. But now that Creative Commons is being used in Wikipedia, all of the Creative Commons content now can be mixed with Wikipedia. So. You know, I want to make a, a point because some, some people, I think, like when I'm in the Middle East, they say, well, this is an American institution. You know, I said, no, 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 this is an international institution. You know, we all have to use the same Creative Commons. Otherwise, we're creating islands. So again, this, this is the idea about open standards. And it, it's, it's the, the value of open standards goes all the way back again to the cost of um, collaboration, the cost of risk. Because unless you have that open standard, the gateways add this additional cost. And so since I'm at the business school, I wanted to focus a little bit on the value of innovation and the value of the economy. And what you find in the examples in the book is these are people who are innovating using sharing, using open. And, but I think that in, in addition to um, you know, these examples here, I know that Spain has, you said, has the most licenses. We really would like to see and maybe ex discuss now in, in, um, and explore with you ways to build examples in Spain um, of people building ecosystems, people making money. Because I think what I'd really like to do, which is very important, is Creative Commons is, and in many places, used to be more a battle. It was always a fight. It was always a debate. I always got invited to debates. you know. But lately, we're getting invited to help, to consult, to support. And so I think that that's also very important to try to find some allies in the business side um, to try to create some examples where um, Creative Commons is helping a, 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 an ecosystem that wasn't traditionally uh, sort of open group.